Hello, everyone, and welcome to Varsity Tutors, where we're so excited to dive into the depths of the ocean to learn more about a type of creature we may be familiar with, but might not know by name, the Nidarian. We're joined today by the lead educator at the Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium, Alexander Konar Konarski, who will be sharing some of the fascinating characteristics behind these aquatic organisms that are known for their sting. Now, before I hand it off to Alexander to get us started, I want to make sure we're prepared to make the absolute most of this live class experience. So here are just a few things to note. As we move through the lesson, you may find you have questions about these creatures and Alexander will have some questions for you as well. So feel free to use the chat panel on the right hand corner of your screen to participate and ask questions and again, answer the questions he'll have for you along the way. And if we don't get to your questions in real time, not to worry, we'll have about 10 minutes at the close of the lesson specifically set aside for Q&A. Now, we're also going to have the opportunity for a hands-on project in today's lesson. And even better, it's everybody's favorite type of class project, the edible kind. So to participate in the hands-on portion of this lesson, students will need a butter knife, a jumbo marshmallow, some sort of edible spread, so peanut butter, frosting, whatever you have handy, and nerd's rope or Twizzlers with sprinkles. Now, if you didn't see the class description to grab these ahead of time, don't worry. Be creative and make what you have on hand do. You'll also want to have your cameras handy for today's class because toward the end of the lesson, we'll have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie with those edible sea creatures if you create them. And if you tag Varsity Tutors and Wonders of Wildlife on Instagram, you'll have the opportunity to win a Wildlife Creature Club subscription with Varsity Tutors. Now, we'll talk more about the prize and specifics on how to enter as we get toward the end of the class. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Wonders of Wildlife lead educator, your instructor for today, Alice Konarski. Awesome, Haley. I appreciate that intro. I think it's phenomenal. And again, like my, they said before, my name is Alexander Konarski. I'm here at Wonders of Wildlife Natural History Museum and Aquarium in the heartland of the USA. We are in Springfield, Missouri. If some of you are unaware of where that is, I think if you look at the United States, we're right smack dab in the middle there, completely landlocked. I mean, we got some lakes and rivers and stuff like that, but we are pretty far from any coastline, whether it's Pacific, the Atlantic, or the Gulf. So now that you guys know where I am, I want to hear where you guys are from. Let's see. I want to see over there in the chat box. So let, me know, let me know where you guys are streaming in from. All right. So let me see how many people we have here locally, how many people we have close to us. I see we got some people with some pretty far out places. That's pretty cool. You guys are awesome for tuning in and wanting to learn a little bit more. Oh, here we go. Looks like we're getting a little bit of uh, kind of some locals here. So maybe like a state away or like a couple more. We got some old Missourians here. Perfect. All right. So now that we've kind of kicked that or kicked into that, we kind of know where I am. We know where you guys are tuning in from. Again, appreciate you so much. We're going to go ahead and talk about our lesson today and our three different sections we're going to cover. So our section one here, we're going to talk about classifications a little bit. And so we're saying the word Nidarians, but we're gonna you know, talk about a little bit more what that actually means because the animal is not called necessarily the Nidarian. They have a more specific name. It's kind of a bigger cluster of organisms together that make up that Nidarian area. So our section two is where we're gonna get real specific and we're gonna start talking about some of them like the jellies. You know, Those are very cool, interesting creature out there. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard some really cool facts about them seen them on different TV shows and things like that. So we're going to dive in a little bit more about them. And then for our third section, we're going to finish on strong with our coral section. So that is, you know, a fan favorite for a lot of people. You know, a lot of times when you go out on vacation, so like the Bahamas or areas like that, you know, you want to look for those nice and pretty coral reefs, you know, where all that vibrant color is, where a lot of sea life is kind of moving around. And so that's going to be our kind of finisher right there at the end. So without further ado, let's kick it into the first section here about those classifications. We're going to pop up some images here, and you might recognize some of these things from when you go to the local grocery store. And so on screen here, you're going to see a couple things, whether they're going to be a glass of milk, maybe a wedge of cheese, maybe some broccoli. Mmm, right? Got to eat your broccoli, kids. You can go up big and strong. You're going to see other things on here like chicken, you know, maybe a banana or two. So take a look at that real quick. Let that soak in. You've got a few different objects, a few different items on here. And I want you guys to start thinking, if you had to group these items together, 
how would you group them? Let's try to make four groups here. So take a quick look, and I want you to make four groups with three of those items in each of those groups. And then we're gonna explain it a little bit more and see kind of what you guys came up with. I say again, you got stuff that's really green, you got some yellow stuff in here, you got some stuff that's sweet, you got some stuff that's maybe a little tart, you got some stuff that, you know, really, really gritty, like some of our meat items maybe. And so moving on past that a little bit, we're gonna let you think about it, take it all in. Like if I held something up in front of you right here, like this jar of peanut butter, I want you to think about that. Where would you go in the store if you had to find peanut butter? And how would you know it's there? Like how would you know where to go to look for it? And that can be something simple too, like a gallon of milk or a banana. You know, if you were sent out to find it, or if you like had a list and you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot this one thing. And you're up at the checkout counter, like you're with mom and dad and they're like, oh, I forgot it. We need to go run and grab that real quick together. You know, how would you know where to go look for that item? And so a lot of times what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for light characteristics. So again, we talked about things that are kind of green, but here with food, we typically go what makes up that food. And so with a banana, what's a banana? Well, it's a fruit, right? Heck yeah, and so our kiwis are fruit also, and our apples, and so that stuff right, right there, they all kind of fit together. So we're gonna go ahead and you know probably push them off to the side. We're gonna say, okay, those three got a lot in common right there, just being fruit. And then what were some of our other items? You know, we had a piece of chicken, we had oh, a good old steak in there, right? And so what are both of those items usually what we call? We call them meat, right? Meats. And so those we probably set off to the side together as well. And now what else did we have? Oh, I think we had a nice big glass of milk in there too. That's really good. We also had some cheese. And for some of you guys that are uh, unfortunately maybe a little lactose intolerant, it doesn't, doesn't sit well with you if you drink some milk or if you eat that cheese, some of you may think it's worth it to just go ahead and do it. But if you are lactose intolerant, you know it's that dairy characteristic right there. It's that dairy product that is kind of in messing with you a little bit, making a little gastro uncomfortability there maybe give some of us the the toots and things like that so that's a good thing to make them all together set them off to the side now so now we got three different groups we saw some things some items left and what we had up there like oh like a carrot you know like stuff that we maybe picture bugs bunny eating or something like that a good old head of lettuce you know that's definitely what you know comes out sometimes before a lot of our meals when we go to a restaurant and so we would classify both of those items as vegetables and so if we had to go find them in the store, we would know exactly where we were kind of going, right? We'd head to the produce or the vegetable side. And so if we kind of pop that next image up there, you guys just see how it's kind of separated apart where you can see all those little items together. And so with that, you know, just kind of, when we start talking about our animal organisms and other things out there in the world, scientists and researchers, we start looking for things that are like animals, like characteristics. And so if you were to think back home, like your dog, you know, what does it have in common with the neighbor dog? You know, they both have fur and things like that. And so with our Cnidarians, some of the famous or the most well-known characteristics about them is gonna be like, what our class is held today? What's that sting? And so stinging is a prime thing there that is gonna be one of their number one characteristics. And if we can kind of get that pulled up here, that way you guys can see those side items. Let me see real quick. So with that is the, they are gonna be having those stinging nematocysts. And then the other one is that they're gonna be invertebrates. Do you guys know what invertebrates are? I wanna see if you guys can tell me what an invertebrate is here. So on the side, go ahead and give me what you think an invertebrate is. Sometimes it's not too, it's not too uh, hard. It's not, we're not looking for a trick answer here. You know, when we think the word, we break it apart, take away that in part, we hear vertebrate. And so we think about what is a vertebrate? Vertebrae. Hmm, maybe start thinking about our spine a little bit here. And so with that, what do you think it means? What are you guys having on that side? What do you think? All right, some of you guys are, oh, you're definitely saying, you know, where's our vertebrae at? It's in our back. So we call that mainly our backbone. Heck yeah, you guys are 100% there. And so with an invertebrate, if a vertebrate has a backbone, what would an invertebrate not have? You guys are right. 
It's without having that backbone. So all of our Nidarians, their invertebrates, that's another big key characteristic that we can use that'll help separate them from other organisms such as ourselves or fish because our fish, you know, they're bony fish, they're gonna have that backbone, you know, kind of that support structure. If you ever think about a jelly, when it moves around, it's pretty uh, spongy, you know, kind of soft, you know, they're not gonna have Alrighty, everyone, it looks like we've got a little bit of a connectivity issue going on for our presentation, but hang tight, we'll be right back with things. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm an Aquarius 2 here at Wonders of Wildlife, and I mainly take care of our jellyfish exhibits and our live food culture, and then I also take care of our river monsters exhibits. Today we are standing in the jelly gallery of Wonders of Wildlife where we have four different species of jellies exhibited. We have the moon jellies which are found all around the globe along the coasts and then we have our blue blubber jellies which you can find along the coast of Australia. Behind me we have the west coast or Pacific sea nettles and they are found along the west coast of the United States from Baja, California all the way up to Alaska. And then we also have our Atlantic sea nettles, which are found along the east coast of the United States. So jellyfish have really unique life cycles. They have different life stages, kind of like a butterfly does. I started working at Wonders of Wildlife about two years before we opened. So I had the great opportunity to help build our jelly and live food culture area. So in these dishes down here, we have moon jelly polyps. When these guys reproduce, they release ephyra, which look like small little ninja throwing stars. They will be push down into this container here where we can catch them and then keep them in a smaller dish until they grow up to about this size right here where they can go through a flow through. Now these guys are about a month old and then once they get bigger they graduate to our other tank where these guys are about two months old. When they get about four or five inches we will put them on exhibit. This is our green algae or nanocoopsis culture. It is a very, very tiny algae that we feed out to our other live food that we grow, our rotifers and our brine shrimp. It makes them a lot more healthy and nutritious before we feed them out to our jellyfish. I hope everyone that comes to Wonders of Wildlife to see the jellies walks away with a greater appreciation for these creatures and all the other animals they see at the aquarium and are inspired to go help save our oceans. All right, so it looks like we are back in business and ready to go. Let's go ahead and hear from Alexander. Alexander, we went ahead and skipped ahead and had a little bit of a spoiler on our jellies with that uh, with that keeper encounter. So if we could go ahead and jump in, uh, I'll go ahead and let you lead the way. Okay, perfect. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. It was te technical difficulty there. Um, not sure what kind of part we cut out on. So if we get that slide back up that you lost me on, we can kind of roll from there on it. And so you guys got to see that video there of Chelsea, one of our lead or one of our aquarists over here that works with our Nidarians. And so to give you guys a little bit more about them, um, that was specifically the jellies. So with our class sections, you guys saw the first section, we we're talking about classification a little bit. Our second section was gonna be more about the jellies, but that video was gonna come up. Again, sorry, technical difficulty, technical difficulties on that side, kind of word vomit here. And our third section was gonna be more about the corals. So kind of touching back on our first section with the classification part. You know, you guys maybe saw some slides with like fruit, vegetables and things like that. And we talked about how we separate those, how we know where those are in a grocery store. You know, we kind of group like things together using known characteristics about them. And so some of the characteristics that we know about our Nidarians is our number one is their invertebrates. And so with that, you know, they do not have that backbone like invertebrate, or sorry, vertebrates do like we are vertebrates we have those vertebrae going up our back there it's going to help us kind of keep that nice structure hopefully you know good posture some of us you know we we kind of duck down a little bit there and then our second one you know we go more over into the carnivorous side you know what do they like to eat that's another helpful characteristic sometimes is when we're talking about that they like to eat meat they're not gonna be out there looking for that nice romaine salad or anything like that. They want that nice, really good protein meal. And then another really good number one 
um, characteristic that we have about them is that they have these stinging cells called nematocysts. And that's gonna be one of our main focuses for today because that's kind of what our class is called. You know, what's that sting? And so moving on past that there, okay, here's a really good diagram for you guys. It shows how that nematocyst sits down. And so that layer that you're seeing, that kind of darker orange layer um, right on the top by the white, that is gonna be like the surface level of whatever the Nidarian is. And underneath that surface level, there's gonna be a little pocket where that stinging cell, that little barb area sits. And when it's triggered, that barb will shoot straight out and it's gonna get, you know, whatever right there that just triggered it. And that's gonna what's gonna deliver that nice sting, you know? It's not electrocution or anything like that. You think of it if you're ever been stung by like a bee or something like that, it's gonna be more what you're thinking about. And so we're moving past our nematocyst um, diagram here. We're going into, again, what are our three cnidarians, our three most common cnidarians that people can think of. We got corals, jellies, and then we have anemones. Our two that we're mainly gonna focus on today though are going to be our jellies and our corals. Anemones are really, really cool, but for you know, time's sake and to let you know, not take up all your guys' day, we're gonna talk about just the jellies and the corals for now. So let's go ahead and move forward with that and get into a kind of I spy game here. Now that you know three types of cnidarians here, I want you guys to look around this underwater scene and I want you to see if you can find three of them. Let's see if we can find one of each. Let's try to find a jelly. Let's try to find a coral. And let's try to find an anemone. So looking around, you know, hmm, let's see here. We got some fish over there in the back. We got a lot of colorful things up here. You know, we're looking around. Some things look like wavy, like maybe there's some grass. We got some definite things in there that kind of resemble coral maybe. You know, a little brighter, not, you know, dark and blending into the background, but really kind of standing out there. We have a, so, yep, some of you guys have kind of seen one right there, smack dab in the middle. It looks like already I see some kind of comments coming up like, it's right there. I see that. All right. So we're going to see. I don't want to give it away for everybody yet. We're going to go in here in a little second or in a second and look and find it. We're going to circle them for you guys. The anemone one's a kind of hard one. That's one that's really kind of hidden in there unless you know what you're looking for. So when we think about anemones, you may have seen some movies out there, you know, ones about these little fish that are really colorful, pretty funny, and they live inside of these things. You know, some people can say they kind of are funny sometimes. They have jokes, if they could tell jokes, maybe. And they live inside of anemones. And so if you can remember that movie or remember those scenes of those little fish swimming inside of them, they kind of those nice flowing, moving um, tentacles and things like that. All right, let's see. All right, we're not gonna keep you guys in suspense anymore. Let's go ahead and pop them up. There we are. So we got our jelly right there, smack dab in the middle. A lot of you guys found that one right away. So I mean, I tried to, you know, we hide a little bit, but you know, it's right there. Can't really like hide behind a rock very well. Right up front, we got some really nice bright corals. Some of you guys were seeing some corals in some other areas and that's awesome. Because again, this is kind of a reef setting here. So you're gonna find multiple varieties of corals all around. And then right there, kind of tucked just off to the side, but in the middle still is going to be that anemone. And it looks kind of resembling some of those corals, but we're going to show a little bit of videos later um, of some of our corals close up. And so we'll move on past our I spy game here. That was a really fun time. But we're going to get into jelly specifically. And so I want you to take a second, though. When you hear the word jelly, you're probably going to think also jellyfish. I know with our video that you guys saw, Miss Chelsea, she kind of used that word interchangeably, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But when you think about jellies, what are some of the things that come to mind? You know, what are some of those first kind of thoughts, those first impacts? You know, a lot of times we're going to start thinking about things we've seen on TV, and for some of us, it may be things we see in cartoons. And so sometimes cartoons are really great and really helpful, and other times, you know, they're more for show, and they're for that entertainment side. And so the facts kind of behind them or the way certain things work in those shows isn't necessarily how they work in the real world. And so you may see some kind of things up here on the screen that you're like, why is that up there? And we're going to cover that. And so going in here, we'll move on past our video here. <laughs> Since you guys have already seen the video with Miss Chelsea, I mean, it was a pretty cool video. You know, that was a really cool thing that she was able to show us. But we're going to start talking about some of the myths behind jellies. And again, it may be some of the things you guys thought of, 
And I'm not going to try and call, I'm not trying to call anyone out or anything like that because, you know, sometimes we just don't know. And that's okay because that's what we're here to do. We're here to kind of sting out those myths and we're here to give you guys real true facts on it. So getting into our first myth here, the number one is they're commonly called jellyfish. Now, again, I know in the video, we talked about jellies and jellyfish. We kind of use that word interchangeably. And sometimes we do that as a facility on our side. And so that way we can help educate more people. And it's a lot easier for people to come in and grasp the term jellyfish um, than it is with a jelly, especially if it's in a large presentation um, view and we have to get more information out that way. But if we wanna help stay more true and more specific to the nature of the jellies, they, that is the term we are going to use as jelly, not jellyfish. Because remember we talked about earlier, they're invertebrates. And so our fish, they're gonna be more in the chordate side. We're not going to get too far into that, but they have that background, backbone. So that's going to help separate them right there. And so, again, if you want to be more correct, you can call them jellies. But if you call them jellyfish, that's OK, too. Everyone's going to know what you're talking about. Let's move into our second myth here. And so with this one is they are filled with jelly. Again, thinking back to some cartoons and things you guys may have seen. You, know, you may see someone go out there and they're fishing for jellies and they catch one and then they pull out a piece of bread and they start, you know, squirting out that jelly and, you know, slathering all over that piece of bread, like they're going to have a nice piece of toast. But jellies are not going to be filled with that kind of jelly. And I know some of you are like, well, yeah, no, duh, it's not that jelly, but it's a jelly substance. So uh, jellies are actually 95% water. And so when you think about that, that is very little to that organism. That is not what they swim in. That's, not, that's what's all around them is water. So I think that they're 95% water. There's not a whole lot there to the jelly itself when we're talking about structure wise. And so that's one of our myths too, that they're filled with jelly. They're not, they're actually 95% water. And going into our third myth here, we have, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, they electrocute their prey. Now we talked about the nematocysts earlier when I said they come out and they sting, they don't electrocute. And again, going back to some stuff we may have seen growing up or things that we hear, or if you ever had the unfortunate encounter with a jelly and you didn't know they were there, you stepped on one or something. Sometimes people may feel like they're getting electrocuted, you know, or we see that representation of, it's easy to show more when a jelly has interacted with something on screen, like in a cartoon by showing that other creature getting electrocuted, but it's not electricity that is pulsing out into their sometimes prey, or it's just sometimes their unlucky victim. It is going to be that sting from the nematocyst, not electrocution. All right, awesome. Now that we got that covered, let's move into our fourth myth here. Some of you guys have maybe guessed this one. Yep, they're pink or purple. That is another big one is that all jellies are pink and purple. And I know the photo that we have up here right now, it shows a lot of pink and a lot of purple, but you guys are gonna see a really cute video later of some of our other jelly species that come in a variety of other colors. They're not always gonna be pink and purple. Some are almost completely transparent. Like you can't see them at all. That's what that transparent means. Like, you know, like they're almost naked to the eye. Sometimes like with our moon jellies that we have, we have to have a special lighting over them. So that way you can actually see them easier. So if you can imagine that you're out in the ocean, there could be things all around you that, and you have no idea they're there because you can't see them. They're almost see-through. All right, moving into our last one. This is probably the most common myth out there. I know some of you already were talking about it is if you get stung, you can help relieve that pain by going to the bathroom on it. I hate to tell you guys this, but, and hopefully none of you have had that happen where you got stung and then someone went to the bathroom or you went to the bathroom yourself, but it will not help. Oh, I know we hear about that all the time. That is probably one of the biggest myths that is shared out there that going to the bathroom is gonna help alleviate that pain. All it's going to do, guys, is you're going to be in pain, and now you're going to have pee on you. It's not very fun. <laughs> not talking from personal experience. I've never had that happen, luckily, but just moving forward, if you guys ever encounter a jelly and you do want to help alleviate that sting and that pain, warm water is actually one of the number one recommendations to help with that. But sometimes, sometimes you got to ride it out and you got to go seek additional attention and maybe, you know, get something to help with that pain other than going to the bathroom on it. All right, cool. Now that we've gotten some of those myths out of the way, we're going to go ahead and talk about some more things that we know. We're going to give you guys some more really good facts. And so jellies lack 
brains, blood, and heart. So remember, we talked about they're 95% water. And so that's why I was like trying to get in there that there's very little that is in their structures, very little to them, you know, physically. You know, they don't have brains and blood. You think, how can they survive? You know, they have really unique anatomies. They've been around for a very, very long time. And they're just able to have a very basic nervous system that can actually help them survive. Like they react to that nervous system. You know, they're not out there really contemplating, you know, what they're doing and how they're going to go about finding food. It's a very basic reaction type of living. And so consider the most venomous marine animal in the world. We're not talking about all jellies. I know some of you guys are like, whoa, okay, hang on there. Not all jellies are super dangerous, and that is true. Now, the one that we're kind of talking about here lives all the way in Australia, lives all the way out there. For some of you guys, it's probably not that far away. For me, that is pretty far away. But that is going to be the little box jelly. That's the Australian little box jelly. Very, very tiny, very, very potent, very, very dangerous. And it is considered the most venomous marine animal. And then we got our last one here. It's kind of this fun thing, you know, if some of you are from – you know, where I am in Missouri, you see a lot of cows and we see, oh, that's a herd of cows, you know, or maybe some, you know, like some more cute fun facts, like with penguins, you know, you call them a waddle if there's a group of them. But what do we call a group of jellies when there's a bunch of them together? Well, you can call them one of three things. You can call them a bloom, you can call them a swarm, or you can call them a smack. It's just kind of the terms that they've been given to help explain what a group of them together is going to be. You know, there's some very cool ones out there, like a group of crows is a murder. I mean, you can start looking up all kinds of cool animal group names. So that's something for you to kind of do afterward if you want. All right, now that we know a little bit more about our jellies, we got some really good facts about them. We're gonna start going into that anatomy a little bit. Because again, with them being a very basic organism, they have a very basic anatomy. And so on this picture here, you can see areas like the stomach. That arrow is actually pointing inside. It's not gonna point right there on the outside of that bell. That is where that other arrow is pointing. The bell is that kind of overlaying umbrella look. The stomach is located inside. And then they also have things like oral arms and tentacles as well as a mouth. And so if we can get that off there real quick, I actually have a fun, cute little, uh, I call it an artifact here, but I'll show you guys a little bit more about that anatomy. And so we're talking about the bell being that overlaying umbrella structure. That is this part right here. You know, kind of the main thing that we think about jellies other than like their tentacles. Let's talk about tentacles though. That would be like these guys off here on the side, these nice kind of thin ones. And then here in the middle is where you're gonna have those oral arms. And so this is where a lot of those stinging cells are gonna be at because those tentacles are gonna help grab onto things that are coming by. And that's why they have so many of them because again, that very basic nervous system, they're very reactive to things around them. So when something comes by and wants to like hit those tentacles and they pull it in and see like, oh, maybe this is something I can eat. It works its way up in these oral arms. So under here, the center, that is where their mouth is going to be. And that was one of our other key identifying facts about cnidarians, they had a very simple digestive system. So food and things go in one end right here. It's not gonna come out the top. It's gonna go into the center of the bell here where the stomach is located, digest what they can, and whatever they cannot digest, they have to expel, just like we do. But it's going to come out of that same entrance right there. So it's an entrance and an exit. And think about that. Let that soak in for a second. Imagine if that's – actually, don't imagine that. But hey, if we eat things, luckily it's not coming back out of our mouth. But for these guys, that's how they live, survive. It's not gross to them at all. You know, they take things in. They got to get rid of it somehow. Can't break down everything. And so we get a little bit past our anatomy here. Let me know a little bit more about their structure. We're going to talk about a little bit what they eat. So think about that for a second. What do you think jellies eat? Now, jellies, remember, come in a wide variety of sizes. We talked about that little box jelly. You know, it's very, very tiny, super small. But then there's things out there called like the lion's mane jelly. Those guys get huge. They can have bells that are seven feet wide. You know, they can have some like tentacles that get up to, you know, 50 feet long. It's crazy. So they're probably going to eat some different things, right? So think about that. What out there in the ocean? I want to see your guys' answers here. I want to see some responses. What do you think are some things that a jelly might eat out in the wild? We think we got fish in the ocean. Sure. We have other little small things floating around as well. Yeah. 
So things like little microorganisms. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm loving your guys' answers. Let's go ahead and get our list popped up here so we can show you guys kind of what they eat. And so microorganisms, the small things floating around. Awesome. That's for because that's what our little guy is gonna eat. That's our little box shells, you know, that's what they want. They're not gonna go out there and like tackle a fish and take it down, but fish are also on the menu for some of our larger ones. And so like that lion's man and things like that, you know, heck yeah, small fish kind of goes in there, it's grabbed, they're gonna, they're gonna eat it, they're gonna digest it. But then another one we have here is other invertebrates. So remember, that's gonna be other things that lack a backbone. And so if something's unfortunate, it's small enough and it swims in there and it cannot escape that grasp of the jelly, if they can eat it, they're going to. So we talked a little bit about what the jellies eat, but they're not the top of the food chain. And so we're gonna talk about what eats jellies. I'm sure some of you look there at the list down below. A number of our, one of our number one things are sea turtles. Sea turtles love to eat jellies. You know, you're gonna see them out there. They're gonna be going to snack town on them. You know, it's a very good diet for some of those sea turtle species. Another one here is sunfish. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the sunfish is, go ahead and give that a, a little Google or a search later. They're a massive species of fish but really cool, but they're, one of their top diets is gonna be jellies as well. And then thirdly, us humans. Some of you, yep, I know some of you are probably kind of like me, you're gonna think, oh, a jelly? Are you sure about that? Well, believe it or not, in some places around the world, and some of you are like, oh, that's pretty good. And yeah, jellies do get eaten in other places around the world sometimes. It's not very common in every area. You know, a lot of places have different style of dishes. For me, I don't know if I like it very much. I'm not a huge like sushi fan and things like that. And I've heard that jellies are kind of, I'm a very texture based person. And so if something's kind of squishy and chewy for too long, to me, I'm going to give that a hard pass. But you know, everyone's each their own. A lot of people like different things. All right. So now we've gotten a lot more into that there about what they or their anatomy is, what they eat. Let's talk about locomotion. And so when I say locomotion, I'm talking about how we move, right? You know, we have locomotion in our arms, we have locomotion in our feet, how we walk around, how we get around. Let's think about the jellies for a second. How do you think, how do you think jellies move? You know, you know we got small ones here. Do they really have control where they go? Are they at a whim of the current, whim of the cosmos, just wherever they're swept is where they go? Do they have to hitch rides on other animals? Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. You know, really take that question in. And then go ahead if you want to, if you think you have a really cool answer or you think you know, go ahead and let me know. I wanna see what you guys think. Cause we have a really cute video to show you about their locomotion. Awesome, we got some good ones popping up here. Perfect. All right, well without further ado guys, let's go ahead and get into our video here. These are blue blubbers that you are about to see on screen here and watch how these guys move around. They are very, very active. Now, a lot of times we think jellies just kind of, you know, they get pushed around. They're at the will of the current. You know, while that may be true a little bit because they're not necessarily very strong, if a really strong current came by, I mean, it would push a lot of things around. If you think about when you're outside and you have a huge gust of wind, I get knocked off balance all the time by that, but I got legs to help me move forward and where I want to go. But sometimes that wind is a little too strong. For them, that would be like an ocean current. But these guys do have the ability to move on their own. And so it's kind of been debated about how their locomotion actually works. And if you guys want to, you can come back here to me and see the kind of artifact I have here. I'll show you how that water works around them. So for a, lot of, a long time, you know, we thought maybe they pulled it in right here underneath, like into their mouth, and then they would push it out. You know, they'd kind of do one of these. Well, if you think about it, if the water goes in here, it'd be like sucking the water in, right? So they'd probably go down. And then if they pushed it out, they'd go back up. Down, they'd go up. Do you think you're gonna really get anywhere like this? Probably not, right? That's like one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back. It's not really gonna take you anywhere. Then you kind of are at the will of whatever else is out there, you know, natural or unnatural pushing you around. But what actually happens, with those blue lovers, and we'll go back to it in just a second after I show you on here, is that when that water kind of comes down, it is actually going around their bell, and they're kind of it has that like nice, nice wave that like flex to it, and so it pulls that water actually up around it, and it goes up underneath them, 
So it comes from the top, goes underneath, and then it pushes down. And so that's going to help maintain that forward momentum. And that's going to help them kind of directionally and where they want to go. And if we can pop that video back up here for you guys to see, now that you kind of know what you're looking for, watch that big one kind of right in the middle, that real big blue one there. And you're going to see that he's kind of hanging out for a second, but then he'll start moving around quite a bit. And I want you to also know this exhibit that you're seeing here at Wonders of Wildlife has a current in it. So it's actually moving around in that exhibit to help give it a natural flow. So that way, if a jelly doesn't help moving, they can rely on that current. But they are pretty much staying stationary. So they're actually fighting that current right there. So that shows that these guys are able to move on their own. If they could not move, you'd be watching them go around in a circle like this. And some of you guys may get kind of dizzy from that. Sorry if I made some of you dizzy by trying to follow my hand there. But these guys have the ability to move on their own, especially that clear one right there, that white one kind of moving across screen. I mean, look at it. He is changing all kinds of directions on us. He is just like, oh, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go that way. You know, they, they are able to move on their own. All right. We're going to get past this here. I know you guys are dying to see what's next. Well, our next area, we're going to talk about our corals. So we've learned a lot about jellies. We've learned a lot about jellies but we cannot forget about our corals. They are also cnidarians. And so remember, since they're cnidarians, they're related to each other. Now, our first question is gonna be, what are corals? Are they animals? Are they plants? Or are they rocks? Let that sink in for a second. We're gonna come over here and give you guys a couple seconds there. Look at that picture. I know that picture is kind of hard to tell. So let's go ahead and flip it to a video for you guys to see. These are some live corals. I don't want to give anybody the false representation here. And they're like, well, come on, man, that was a drawing. So look right here. You can tell this is live or active because we do have fish moving around and stuff like that. So right back there, you can see a lot of different coral species, some that kind of move around, some that are kind of stationary. So what do you think? Are they animals, plants, or are they rocks? Oh, man, I see a lot of variety of answers here. Don't worry. This is one that kind of goes all over the place sometimes. You know, we... People get tricked out all the time about this, but I'm going to go ahead and give you guys the answer. They are animals. I know some of you are like, oh, what? But that looks like a flower in there, man. That one kind of looks like a tree, but they are animals, guys. And so what actually makes them animals is because they have a little organism in them called a polyp. And that polyp is what's actually going to be that animal part to them. And so we're going to move past this here. Now that we know that they're animals, we're going to get a little bit more into the coral itself. Where can we find corals? Let's think about that. If you were to go out and look for corals, some of us that have been to beaches, or some of us that may have learned about them or have seen videos about them, where are you gonna find them? Are you gonna find them floating out in the middle of the ocean, like on the top? Or are you gonna find them just kind of out, way out there floating around in the middle of the water column? Or are you gonna find them more closely to land? Let's see what you guys think. Man, a lot of you guys are on top of it. Land, that's right. We're gonna find them closer to land. Now, there are some coral species, I don't want to leave you wrong, but there are some coral species that live deep, 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 deep down into the ocean depths, but they live near like hydro vents. We're not going to focus on those guys. They're pretty cool, but we're going to focus more on the ones you're going to find near the coast. That is where majority of our coral species are, and they're going to rely on that sunlight. And so we're going to talk why they rely on that sunlight here in a little bit, but that's where you're going to find them. Nice, close to the, co or close to the coast there. Man, that's a tongue twister close to the coast for corals. All right. So now that we know where some of them are, let's talk about the reefs. How do reefs form? Well, reefs kind of have a very unique structure about them, but a lot of times our reefs are built corals on top of each other. Sometimes it's not really often it's going to be a live coral on top of another live coral, but sometimes they don't get along very well. It's kind of hard to think that these guys would maybe fight each other, but they do. So a lot of times you'll have corals that are on top of pre-existing corals, ones that were once alive, but then have since deceased, and what they leave behind is their skeleton. And so what I have here in front of me are going to be some of those skeletons. So we come back to me here, like this right here. This is a pipe organ. I'll come a little bit closer. Maybe it'll focus a little bit for you. These are a pipe organ skeleton. And then this guy right here is a blue coral. That guy pulled up here so you can see it a little bit better. And so these are going to be some of those skeletal structures that may be left behind. Now that we know a little bit more about how the reefs form, we're going to talk about these guys more specifically. Going into our two main types of corals, we have hard corals and we have soft corals. Now with hard corals, 
when they die or when they pass on, what they leave behind is that skeleton. The soft corals, when those guys decide that they're gonna pass a little bit or pass on, they are gonna almost disappear into nothing. There's not gonna be much left behind of them. And so their structure is a little bit different with that calcium carbonate that the polyp produces to create that skeletal structure. And so now that we kind of know a little bit more about that, with the soft corals, they are usually visually gonna be a much more wavy. They're gonna be kind of flowing around more like a grass or a fan style of look. You know, they're gonna have a lot more movement to them. Where hard corals, if you were out there and you saw a live hard coral, it's gonna look like one of those branches, one of those sticks just sticking up there in the water, or it's gonna look like that rock kind of shape, that formation like a brain coral or something like that. You know, so it's kind of an easy way to tell when we're talking about hard and soft corals. It's one of the times they made it easy for us here with those naming uh, games. And so now that we got a little bit more about where they're from or where you're gonna find them, how they form, we're gonna move into the anatomy of the polyp. So again, remember, because they are animals, you know, these polyps are that little organism there. So there's a video right there on the side of one of our corals here at Wonders of Wildlife down in our live coral exhibit. And it's gonna show you how close up that some of those polyps form. They're gonna be inside that coral structure. So the main coral structure is that calcium carbonate, it's that kind of housing for them, and the polyps live inside of that. And so we'll let you guys see how you know, close you have to get sometimes to see some of these polyps. And so that's pretty cool, right? Watching it kind of zoom out. You never think like when you're out there looking at them, you think that whole thing is the same thing. It's all one together. Well, all the polyps that are on a piece of coral, they're all gonna be genetically the same. You know, they're almost the same thing. They kind of bud off each other that way, but they're not gonna be the same genetically as the coral next to it. So going back to the pipe organ here real quick, I wanna show you guys on that and the blue one. I'll bring them both up. We'll start with the blue guy though. You see those tiny little holes that are in there and stuff like that? That is where those polyps would actually be. They would live right there inside of those holes. All right, and so now we know a little bit more about where they're from, how the reefs form, and with our polyps, let's go back to our anatomy of a polyp real quick because again, that is our main organism. That is what's related to our jelly here. And so they have a very similar kind of structure as like a jelly, as far as like the base um, parts of them, you know, with their anatomy structure. They have those tentacles right there at the top. That's what's gonna help grab things that are flowing by that they're gonna pull in toward that mouth. And remember that mouth is that one way entrance. It's gonna go down into that digestive or digestive sac or that stomach. And then it's gonna spit it right back out of that mouth and they're done with it if they cannot digest it all. But if you look on that really closely on one of those tentacles right there, you're gonna see where those nematocysts are housed. We talked about in the jelly, you know, they're gonna be more on those ends right here of the oral arms for the coral and those polyps are gonna be right there on the tentacles. So when things go by, they're gonna trigger that nematocyst. It's gonna come out and it's gonna get them. You know, it's gonna sting them right there. But if you look, also, right underneath those nematocysts, there's this big word right there. It starts with a Z. That is called zooxanthellae. So now the zooxanthellae, that is actually something entirely different. That is an algae or an algae that lives inside of the coral polyps. And so it's a really cool symbiotic relationship that's going on in our coral world there. And I know maybe trying to confuse some of you guys there when I asked about their plants earlier, the corals are still animals, but that algae kind of hitches a ride. It kind of protects its protection from all the stuff around them by living inside of that polyp. And that's why they need to live really closely to those sunlight areas because that algae is what relies on the sunlight. And it also in return for being able to live with the polyp, it produces some energy and it gives some nutrients to the polyp and to the coral to help it stay nice and healthy. And it's also what makes the corals a lot of times really bright and beautiful in color. And so it's a really, really cool symbiotic relationship that they have. A lot of times though, if the zooxanthellae is not present in the coral, for whatever reason, like stressors and things like that, the water change, or if it gets too hot, the coral actually usually cannot survive without the zooxanthellae because they cannot catch enough food on their own. So that's a really, really cool thing to learn about here. But our next thing here, we had you guys grab a lot of snacks in the very beginning, and that is because it is snack time. So we're gonna make our own coral polyp. So hopefully you guys have not started eating all of your snacks and you still have some stuff left behind, but you guys have been asked to grab things like marshmallows and things like that. So I'm gonna put mine here right in front so you guys can see it. I grabbed a nice uh, unicorn style marshmallow here. It's very colorful. Some of you guys maybe have like the really big fat ones and things like that. Perfect. 
So take your marshmallow, and if you have a tool, maybe like a toothpick or something, start making a little few holes in it, just like this. This is gonna be our main polyp structure. So this right here is the main body of our polyp. All right, so now we got some of our holes made. What we're gonna do is we are gonna have to add some of those tentacles to it. So this is where your red vines, your twizzlers come in handy. So if you haven't started, go ahead and start peeling those apart and making some smaller ones. You don't, you don't need to get a great big, huge one. It's gonna be hard to say in your marshmallow, but hey, if you wanna go for it and make some crazy long tentacled polyps, by all means, it's your snack. <laughs> so you're gonna take your little red vine, you're gonna stick them into those holes. There we go. We're starting to make our tentacles a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and make my hole a little bit bigger here. I think I'm gonna have a bunch of them sticking out of the top. I'm gonna make a very uh, tall polyp. Oh no, we lost this tentacle. That's okay. Doctor's in the house. We're gonna fix it. All right, we got one. We got two. I'm gonna go ahead and just add a third one here. Awesome. I know sometimes it takes like an artist's touch to be able to get some of these things looking the way we want them to, you know, we think, or we go to dinner and we see like really nice food dishes and you're like, man, that looks really good. And you try to go make it at home and you're like, oh, well, my attempt, right? I try. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm doing right here. We had one made earlier and I'll show you guys that one because it's probably gonna look a little bit better than the one I have. But what we're gonna do next is we're going to make that calcium carbonate kind of skeleton now. And so that is what's actually produced by the coral to help protect itself. It's that really hard outer layer, especially for our nice hard and stony corals. I'm gonna use peanut butter. Some of you guys may have other things like frosting and stuff like that. We're gonna nice and lather that up. My fingers are gonna be a mess after this. That's okay. Hopefully you guys won't judge me too much. You know, in the education world here, we get nice and dirty sometimes or sticky. You know, it happens. There we go. Set a little bit more here, make sure our, our coral polyp is nice and protected. Awesome, sweet. So for our last thing here, if you guys got the like uh, nerds rope and things, your little twizzler, your tentacles are already gonna have those zooxanthellae pieces on them, which is really, really cool. But if you don't, you're like me and you can only find twizzlers, we're gonna use some sprinkles here. Or maybe for some of my older generation jimmies, I don't know. I call them jimmies, but you call them sprinkles probably. We're gonna take some of those sprinkles and we're gonna just kind of put them right here on the side of our polyp. Let's get a little bit on our Twizzler though. How about that? Because that's where the Zoxanthellae is actually gonna live is on those tentacles. I just didn't know how artsy I could be right now. If, I look, if this looks intense, it's very intense on my side. So I'm, I'm a very protect, I'm a, oh, what's the word here? perfectionist when it comes to my food art. All right, pick up some more of our zooxanthellae. Get it nice and in there. Perfect. All right, what do you think? The masterpiece, right? I think it looks, I think it looks pretty good. You know, maybe I'm gonna showcase it later, but all right. I'm going to give you guys a second if you want to keep playing around with yours. Some of you guys may have other items um, that you grabbed as well. So thinking about the kind of coral structure, the anatomy of our polyps there, if you want to start adding stuff in there, go ahead, get crazy with it. We're going to give you a little bit more time. That way you can have it nice and ready for your photo in a second, because that's what we're going to have you showcase. Just like you had to see mine, we're going to see your guys' okay. I think it's only fair, right, Haley? That's absolutely right. We'll give students just a couple more moments to add their final touches to those polyps. But in the meantime, we've had some really wonderful questions come in. I know I want to make sure we're being conscious of your time, but if we have time to answer just a couple of those as students wrap up their, sna their snack craft. Uh, I'd love to toss a few of those questions your way. 
Heck yeah, let's get into it. All right. Well, to go ahead and get us started, we had a whole bunch of questions that dealt with the biggest and the smallest and the best and the most dangerous of each of these species. So maybe you could speak just a little bit more. I know we got some details on whether there are maybe any dangerous jellies over here in the United States, uh, some of your favorite species, and a little more on some of the interesting species. Okay, so with some of the jellies, like we're talking about North America, there's not any that are gonna be necessarily too crazy, too dangerous. You know, we have like Pacific sea nettles and Atlantic sea nettles and things like that. That's gonna be one of our larger species. They're gonna look and resemble more kind of like this guy here. I mean, he's not looking perfectly like one, but the nettles are gonna be more of what you're gonna see around here, but nothing crazy like the Australian box jelly, you know, that if you got got by one of those, that you would want to definitely immediately like seek attention for. It's going to hurt still. They'll, they'll sometimes hurt like the Dickens. And then we'll also have other um, species in certain areas, like some of our more tropical regions. We start getting lower into the Gulf, like our mangroves and Bahama areas. But as far as like my favorite jelly, ooh, I mean, we talked about the lion's mane one a little bit earlier. And now, again, give that one a search in a little bit, but they get huge. I mean, they're the largest jelly species out there. Again, their bells meet like seven feet wide. Their tentacles get crazy long. I mean, that in itself is a pretty awesome fact and feature to think of if you were out there. But there's also these like little ones that like float on the surface. There's upside down jellies that are really cool. So, I mean, if you think about a jelly, but like this, like all the time, like it's just upside down. Those guys are also really, really all right, and then we also had questions around how long they can live, whether or not they can feel pain with that kind of difference in whether or not they have a brain or a central nervous system that you talked about earlier on. So could you speak maybe a little more to that? So it really depends on like the jelly species when we talk about lifespan, because it's it goes with a lot of different organs out there as well. Yeah, they're all, you know, pretty close related, but they can live quite a bit different time, um, time lengths, time gaps trying to think here, but yeah, like different lifespans. And then when you're talking more about, sorry, what was the, oh, the anatomy, right. The, if they can feel pain. So when they lack some of those more defined characteristics, those defined features like a brain, they have a very simple nervous system. We don't really say necessarily they feel pain. What it's going to be is that they're going to feel more of a reactive kind of sense to it. So whether or not it hurts, they're going to react to it no matter what. But I wouldn't say necessarily that they're going to be able to register the pain on it. And so, cool. go ahead. Oh, no, very cool. By all means, have at it. I'll say the moon jelly is one that's really, really cool because they can live about two months. And so it's, again, it just varies. It varies on the species on how long they're going to last. You know, that's something really cool that'll look up and you can maybe make a chart. Maybe it's like extra homework there. You go know, pick a couple species, find out which one lives the longest. <laughs> Absolutely. So we had lots of students who were interested in how you became interested in these creatures and also to go ahead and round things off uh, to, to get class uh, toward the close and ready for that selfie because I think our students might be about ready with their snack crafts. Uh, how you got involved and also how, how they can get involved and do more uh, with these species. Perfect. That's a great question, Haley. So with me, my interest in jellies, um, I would say kind of I mean, more started once I started working at an aquarium, because with my history and where I started in the animal field, you know, I was very focused on things on land. I'm not the best swimmer myself. So when it came to things in the ocean, I didn't really pay a whole lot of, to them until I started being able to get into that field. So working here at the aquarium, I've been able to learn a much bigger respect and understanding for a lot of our different sea creatures that we have all over the world. And jellies are one of them. You know, they are very, very cool, unique creatures. And my, before that, I just would see them on like TV and shows and things like that and go, okay, avoid them. You know, they're going to hurt. But being here, you get to learn, you know, what makes them unique, you know, what we can do more about them and, you know, what are their kind of places in the world that they're not just something that's out there and exists. You know, sometimes we think about organisms and how they connect with what the earth and the world around them. But jellies have a very vital role in the food chain out there in our oceans. And so it's really cool when you get to learn more about them that way. And then as far as 
getting involved in things like this, like we're at an aquarium or at a zoo, honestly, going to them for is the first step, you know, go out there, see the place, see the facility, you know, kind of nurture that growth and that, um, you want to call it like getting just that, I'm trying to think of the word. It's like the appreciation for them. That's the best thing I could probably say there's that the appreciation of why they're important, you know, what they do for our world. And then from there, depending on how old you are, get into summer camp programs, you know, you know, talk to a keeper. If they have a time, ask them questions. That's the best way to know. I ask a million questions and sometimes my colleagues are like, okay, Alex, but it's the best way to learn. And then also, if you're old enough, volunteer. Volunteering is a huge one. I'm, there are facilities that love, I mean, we all love our volunteers and they do so much for us, but it helps show their passion and appreciation for what we're trying to do as a facility, you know, for all of these creatures that we take care of. And so getting started, I'm saying, go to your zoo, go to your local aquarium. If it's a drive, I understand if you can't go there all the time, but definitely try to make the time to get out there or even just getting into wildlife itself and just stopping and taking a moment to just appreciate what's around, you know, what we have. And then definitely get out there, ask questions, volunteer, all that good stuff. And then look on your own, you know, watch videos, look stuff up. If you have a question, try to find that answer, you know. Sometimes the best way to get those answers is do your own research because you'll find out more things then what the, maybe the one thing is you were trying to look for, and that's a huge thing on our side is we look for the answer of one thing, but we'll find out a whole bunch of other stuff along that road and on that journey. And that's probably the coolest thing about it. Well, it sounds like that curiosity to learn, which probably brought most of our students here today is, uh, is probably the biggest piece of advice we could have. Now, hopefully everyone has wrapped up their snack crafts and I think Alex has his handy as well. So let's go ahead and get ready for that selfie. And as a quick reminder, if you post that selfie to Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as Wonders of Wildlife, you'll be entered to win that, that, uh, that club membership. So so let's go ahead and get things ready for that selfie. All right, guys, when you're ready, we're going to pop that video up there. It's going to showcase you're going to see some nettles at the top, moon jellies on one side, and then our blue lovers on the other. Gonna get yourself in the middle, hold up your polyp nice and bright. Mine's kind of falling apart on this side, but this one's pretty cool. All right, let's get some of those good selfies. I think my polyps falling apart. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, hopefully everyone had the opportunity to snap a photo with their craft. Uh, now, I want to make sure we're conscious of your time. Thank you so much for hanging an extra couple of minutes to answer some of those questions from our students. Uh, so any final thoughts for us before we wrap up today's class? Yes. First one, I appreciate you guys on this journey with us today. I know we've a little past, but we appreciate you guys so much. And then if I could leave you with anything, maybe the three R's when you're thinking about conservation at is reduce, reuse, recycle, you know, whatever you can do to get out there and help your community and, you know, reusing and reducing all the stuff around them. And also you're going to see a link later in a little bit, maybe that's going to go take you to a place called our mission conservation. And so if you want to further your knowledge a little bit, what you learned today, make sure to click onto that link, have a parent help you. It'll take you to our, um, or our page and we'll have some really good instructions on there about how to download the game and how to interact with it. And then you guys can move on and really just, you know, expand your growth. Again, that's one of the best ways to learn. Wow, thank you so much for your time, for all of your insights, uh, not only to Alex, but to the entire team at Wonders of Wildlife. And thank you to all of you who tuned in live today and asked such thoughtful questions and got involved with our craft. We hope you continue to get involved and join us when Wonders of Wildlife returns on May 20th to teach us more about some of the creatures under their care. But in the meantime, we hope to see you back in another Varsity Tutors Star Course sometime soon. In the meantime, don't forget to post those selfies and tag us at Varsity Tutors, as well as Wonders of Wildlife. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye, guys.